Coming up on Market to Market, the EPA pumps out new blending levels fueling a mixed reaction. Balancing windrows and butterflies takes more than just bailing wire. And market analysis with Naomi Bloom, next. Larger growing segments. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it. This is the Friday, June 29 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Delaney Howell. The Senate conducted pre-holiday weekend business by passing their version of the Farm Bill. The measure, which supports farmers and ranchers as well as providing food assistance, heads to a conference committee to hash out differences with the House version. As lawmakers fan across the country, some of their constituents are buying a new dwelling. New home sales jumped 6.7% last month, mostly on purchases in the South. Consumers felt less buoyant about the economy in May, but the measure is still above average historically. Orders for long-lasting items fell six-tenths of a percent last month on dwindling demand for cars and aircraft. Ethanol production rolled to a third straight week of gains, the highest in 26 weeks. The expansion in renewable fuel production is powering critics that are calling the government mandate for biofuel additives outdated. Proponents of the homegrown product say the EPA has left the ethanol running on empty. John Torpy reports. This week, the Environmental Protection Agency handed down new rules regarding the renewable fuel standard, outlining clear winners and losers in the biofuels industry. For conventional ethanol, EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt stuck with the status quo, proposing to keep the 2018 level of 15 billion gallons. Biofuels proponents argue the proposed target fails to leave room for future expansion in the industry. The Iowa Renewable Fuels Association, an ethanol advocacy group, says the 15 billion gallon mandate is a soft number due to the EPA's controversial practice of issuing hardship waivers to some refineries. Some experts see keeping with existing production levels could be a detriment to the ethanol industry. It's easy to establish that that was the most important policy decision uh, that the EPA had to make for this rulemaking, and they basically uh, said, uh, no way, no how, are we going to listen to anybody and we're just going to charge ahead. If the zero reallocation holds, uh, then uh, this will be a major defeat for the ag interest and Senator Grassley. As my colleagues know, Iowa that, Senator Charles Grassley is concerned the actual amount of renewable fuels in the 2019 RFS will be closer to 13.5 billion gallons, which is a blow to farmers and hurts ethanol producers. We won't get much ethanol used because big oil does not want to use any product they don't control and they don't control ethanol. House Agriculture Committee ranking member Colin Peterson released a statement attacking the decision. Our corn and soybean farmers are fed up with EPA undermining the RFS and the harm being done by the administration's trade war. Enough is enough. The American Petroleum Institute, an oil industry trade organization, agreed with the EPA's decision but believes the entire process is flawed. The agency's latest proposal for 2019 is yet another example, in fact, it's an annual example, of a broken government program that needs a comprehensive legislative solution that includes the sunset of the program. There were a few renewable fuel producers who came out ahead under the new RFS goals. Advanced biofuels, such as those derived from algae, 
saw a proposed increase of almost 600 million gallons for 2019. Standards for cellulosic ethanol were boosted to 100 million gallons, and biomass diesel received a 300 million gallon bump. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Baling season is in full swing across rural America. In the land of 10,000 lakes, it's just as common to see a bale along the highway as it is in a field. Grassland in Minnesota has legislators and landowners debating the fate of more than 175,000 roadside acres. Colleen Bradford Krantz digs deeper into the important source of hay and wildlife habitat in our cover story. For generations, Minnesota farmers have made a habit of mowing and making hay from the grass growing in roadside ditches. But since 2016, state officials have begun increasing awareness of an existing but largely unpublicized or unenforced law that had, since the mid-1980s, required farmers to obtain permits for such work. There's been a greater emphasis of understanding what all of the different benefits that occur in the right-of-way. And probably the largest has been expansion of interest uh, to spread out to pollinators, the monarch butterfly. And that escalation really had other people coming to the department and asking us to step up the enforcement of the statutes that were in place. State transportation officials say boosted enforcement guidelines would have required farmers to have, among other things, a $1 million liability insurance policy with the state listed as one of those insured. It was um, shocking to all of us that the permit had been on the books for a long time and never enforced or ever dealt with. We had never heard of it, period. Grant Breitkreitz used to bale hay on 120 miles of roadside ditches in the early years of his cattle operation. The work returned more than 700 additional bales a year for feeding his cattle during the winter. According to state officials, the 1980s era law was originally designed to give the offspring of ground nesting birds, like pheasants, time to hatch and move on before the ditches were mowed. Since the measure was rarely enforced, farmers mowed and made hay in the ditches in late June and July, as they had for generations. State Representative Chris Swazinski, who farms in southwest Minnesota, was frustrated with the ban on mowing and baling the ditches before August 1st, and was among the legislators who last month successfully placed a second one-year moratorium on all enforcement. When someone goes in the ditch in the wintertime, we're the ones that go fix the ruts. We're the ones that replant the grass in those spots. We're the ones that pick up the garbage and, and all that. And so we've managed these ditches for the last 80 years. We think the, the department's just simply wrong to put this burdensome red tape on farmers when a system's already worked great for many years. Swazinski is frustrated the state's roadside maintenance costs may increase if the work done by farmers in exchange for hay is delayed until late summer. Various interest groups met in the past year to discuss strategies, but the debate remains unresolved. Ideally, we'd like to have a, you know, a vegetation management plan for our roadsides and doing maintenance when it's called for, when it's right to get the desired result that we want. And I'm not saying that haying isn't a portion of that. Haying is a, a management technique that can be used. It just has to be done at the right time. But defining that right time is where much of the dispute lies. That time of year, uh, especially a year like this, where in our year we're very dry, the quality of the feed is, is deteriorated by that point. Any grasses that you're paying, as they mature and ripen, they become woody and dry and uh, become less, less feed value and less palatable for the animals. Neighboring South Dakota requires farmers in certain counties to wait on haying ditches until after June 15th or July 10th at the latest. Iowa allows those with a permit to bale hay along certain roads after July 15th. Minnesota farmers worry that leaving ditches unmowed until August could lead to the maturing, seeding, and spreading of noxious weeds. The invasive species, mainly the Canadian thistle, is huge in Minnesota, take over the ditches, and then it spreads into our fields and spreads into the other ditches. But Minnesota officials say state maintenance crews could mow ditches earlier in the summer on a case-by-case -case basis. Farmers harvesting hay also have, at times, inadvertently hampered state road crews' efforts to manage weeds. 
they'll go through and they'll apply herbicide and um, no more than two hours later, there's a farmer in there haying it. Proponents argue that several species, including the monarch butterfly, whose numbers are dwindling, have lost too much tall grass habitat in Minnesota. The state did lose about 700,000 acres of CRP ground between 1992 and 2012. However, over those two decades, much of the rural land went to new development, which increased by roughly 400,000 acres. The state also saw a slight increase in forest and pastureland acreage, while cropland decreased slightly. Farmers argue that unmowed ditches may mean motorists fail to see approaching deer and other wildlife, creating the potential for more accidents. Many established producers also worry that the younger and smaller acreage farmers will take the brunt of the delayed hay harvest. I've got a neighbor down my road from my main farm uh, who he works in town as a plumbing and heating guy, but he also loves agriculture. He bought this acreage with his wife to raise a few goats on and some cattle. And quite frankly, he doesn't have the land to go out and just put up hay for winter. Todd Thompson, who farms near East Chain, Minnesota, does harvest hay from the ditches adjacent to his land, but wouldn't be heartbroken if he lost the option to mow earlier in the summer. If he had to spend several hundred dollars for a new insurance policy, he would stop paying ditches. Oh, you're just in a tractor and you're at, on an angle, you know, and something could happen, something could break down, you might tip over. It's dangerous and it's hard. As the interested parties debate the issue in the coming year, Minnesota will be under the legal microscope. A lot of the other states were actually watching Minnesota this year um, to see how everything would pan out. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. Pre USDA report positioning, trade non negotiation, and weather all factored in the commodity markets, which mostly rallied Friday. For the week, September wheat fell three cents, while the nearby corn contract declined seven cents. USDA reported more soybean acres than corn for the first time since 1983. The market initially rallied Friday, but reversed course to end another brutal week as the August soybean contract lost 37 cents. August meal tumbled $9 per ton. In the softs, December cotton continued to fall, losing $1.38 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, July Class 3 milk futures lost 9 cents. Much of the livestock sector rallied late week as the August cattle contract added 83 cents, August feeders put on $2.13, and the August lean hog contract improved $1.07. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained 17 ticks. Crude oil rocketed higher by 5.57 per barrel. Comex gold weakened 16.20 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index added 16 points to settle at 4.8710. Joining us now to offer insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Naomi Bloom. Naomi, welcome back. Hi, thanks Delaney. Naomi, we had a big report day today. We had the acreage report of, as well as the quarterly grain stocks report. So let's just take it overall here. What were your thoughts about the report? Well, at least the report wasn't bearish. So that was the biggest takeaway from the whole thing. Uh, looking at the big picture, um, the quarterly stocks, all numbers, all came in truly as anticipated, nearly right on the average yeah. estimates for all categories, corn, beans, and wheat. Um, as far as the acres go, uh, wheat acres were up about a half million acres from the March estimate. Soybeans also up just over a half million acres from the March estimate. And corn acres up a million from the March estimates. But all of these things were expected. Uh, the corn number a little bit larger than what people were looking for, but within the range of expectations. So because there was not any big surprise, the market was able to find some short-term footing and at least not plunge any lower for the rest of the of the trading day for the day. Absolutely, and going forward, we've got some big dates coming up here with tariff deadlines you said earlier. You're a little nervous to be on the show tonight because a lot of producers are watching July 5th, July 6th. We have tariffs going into effect with Canada. I want to take a social media question here when we look at exports and tariff news that's coming here in the near future. Paul in Columbus, Wisconsin said, with the recent price drop happening, will exports increase before those tariffs go into effect? That's a question that I was wondering today 
and, and for the past few sessions as well. Um, we did see some export sales this morning before the USDA report came out, but it was nothing that would just make the market rally in and of itself. Uh, we're hopeful maybe early next week we'll see something come to life, but at this point it doesn't feel like that's going to be the case. It continues to be a showdown between countries of the world, and it's going to create more market volatility all next week and potentially the week after that as well. So we have to watch every day for the freshest piece of news that can come from it. Let's talk about news that's going on in the wheat markets. Egypt announced that they were having lower harvested acres than they expected. Will that give the U.S. some opportunity to export more wheat or will they be looking more to the Black Sea region in Russia for their needed wheat supplies? Yeah, I would say logistically they'll probably continue to stick with Russia just because it's closer. But what it does do is emphasize the point that little pieces around the world are showing some issues with production. Uh, Russia's production is down a little bit. And then today, the reason the market rallied before the USDA report for wheat was because we found out pr French production is now lower as well. So we have all of these little pieces of production falling a little bit globally. And so the market is trying to find some support. And then we'll see that as we go forward with finding out for sure what our winter wheat harvest is and how the spring wheat can develop as summer continues. Absolutely. Let's jump over here into the into the corn markets. Um, with the acreage report, was that any surprise to you? I know we talked a little bit about it at the beginning of the program, but I want to really dive into the report with you. Yeah, the, as far as how the acres came out, it, it wasn't a surprise to me. I, I was thinking definitely maybe like a half million more mm -hmm. acres. The million mark um, surprises me a little bit. I think the biggest thing right now, though, to focus on besides trade is what's happening with the crop, with all of the excessive rain. It's not just um, too much rain from the standpoint of it's it's too much rain for a crop to grow, but think about the nitrogen that's getting washed away. Think about how the roots are shallow and, and not able to penetrate deep into that soil with this excessive heat coming. On my drive here yesterday, the corn is tasseling across mm -hmm. I-80. And while it looks fantastic, there is some shallow roots out there and we'll see how production ends up being with the loss of nitrogen as we go forward. What does your balance sheet look like for corn moving forward? Um, looking forward, we still have smaller U.S. supplies, smaller global supplies. That keeps the market supported, but we need to have additional demand news, and now we have to essentially wait until harvest to know truly what's out there or not. The market has been trading in 180 bushel yield That was going to be my next question. Yeah, and, and I think that's a bit premature. I would say trendline is appropriate at this time, but with the photos that we're seeing across social media, uh, it'll be interesting, and of course we have to just wait until harvest, but um, I think 180 is a little high. Okay. What about when you look at a price point here? Where do we sit price-wise? We put in a low of about 360. Is that our low for the summer, or are we going to have to wait and see with weather and tariffs and all those other factors coming forward? Uh, well, do you have to wait and see? I would say for the next two weeks it probably is a low, and we hopefully can see a recovery bounce or a weather scare bounce or that type of a thing. Um, but we need some positive trade news in order to really see this market come back to where it had been. I think the, the big trade news question sits in soybeans, so let's take it there next. Uh, with the tariffs going into effect on July 6th, without any last minute changes or negotiations, has this already been fully factored into the market or should producers expect to see some price volatility on July 6th? You're gonna see price volatility all next week. And what makes me the most nervous is that today at the close, Beans finished about four cents lower, mm -hmm. which when, you wouldn't think as much, but they posted a bearish outside reversal. And technically speaking, now it poses the possibility for prices to go and retest the low from the catastrophic fall that we had recently. So that could be another 20 to 30 cents just to even retest those levels before it can find some sure footing. It's like we've gone bungee jumping and we are still waiting for our cord mm. to tighten. And we haven't even had that happen yet. The tariff issues are what is threatening this market. And until we can get it figured out, unfortunately, the market doesn't like uncertainty and the funds are going to stay short. So the tariff thing needs to happen sooner than later. So with that being said, what should producers be doing over the next week here to prepare for that news and prepare for that to go into effect? Um, continue to keep an eye on your local cash markets in case basis levels maybe can, can improve in some capacity. Um, it may be worthwhile with how the market finished today to buy some August short-term puts just in case this continues to fall apart. Because if the market can bounce, I think a lot of people have beans that have been sold, mm -hmm. but if the market can bounce, we can do more with new crop sales 
but the risk still is the downside until this gets figured out. Okay. Let's take it over here and talk about the, the cattle markets because they actually had some optimism yes. today here at the end of the week. <laughs> right. We finally got some good news. We were limit up in both live cattle and feeder cattle. What's going on there? We had some great cash news that happened today. So uh, cattle in, in Texas was trading at 107, and so that was able to lift the cattle market limit up today for those front month contracts, which was great because we had a cattle on feed report this week, which was um, showing large supplies, the largest June 1 number since 1996. So we have the supply of cattle, which we've known and it's been priced in, but thankfully domestic demand has been fantastic and our exports are up 13% year over year. And so we have um, a perfect demand situation, um, which is offsetting the increase in production. And, and we're gonna see going forward the cattle market continue to trade in more of a um, kind of a, like a little bit of a sideways back okay. and forth type of pattern. What are you looking pattern. for that range for the sideways? Um, on the bottom side, um, a buck even, mm -hmm. on the upside maybe like 113, 114, okay. and it's going to be up and down, back and forth in there until we find out who is going to blink first in terms of the larger production winning out or can demand stay as strong as it is now heading into the third quarter. Right, and heading into the third quarter, that's when we usually back off the grilling season. The fourth is kind of that price or that, uh, that time of the year when we back off. Do you think that that's going to hold true for this year too? We've had wet weather, not necessarily warm weather. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think demand is going to actually hang in there and be okay in terms of um, like hamburger um, as far and ground meat and things like that and, and steak. Um, as a mom who does the shopping for back to school, mm -hmm. that's where the extra slush money is going to be going sooner than later. Um, but in the short term, the demand is, is there and it's strong as long as the economy keeps progressing like it's been. Absolutely. And you had an interesting thing. I noticed the slush comment was from your from your newsletter this week. You had another interesting comment that I wanted to make sure and ask you about as we transition to talking pork here. You said the pork complex is seeing a potential reduction in exports. You know, we've got the Mexican tariffs, the Chinese tariffs coming forward, and we're going to potentially see some of that meat flooding the U.S. domestic market. With that being said, will consumers opt then to buy pork or will they continue buying beef? Um, I, and, and my response is um, there's not a substitute for beef. There's so not. There's not. <laughs> so as long as, um, as long as there's enough economy being strong, I think that beef in and of itself is gonna just have its own demand. Now there does come a point if the gasoline prices continue to rally with crude oil breaking out to the upside and we'll get this to week. That. And, and um, depending on your back to school situation, mm -hmm. there might be a, a chance where, you know, if, if it's on sale at the grocery store, I would maybe buy a little bit more pork just because then I can give more money to my kids' school needs. Mm -hmm. um, but overall, demand for pork domestically has been all right and our exports have been good driving driving front months, and that's why that front month is higher. But the All Hogs report that came out this week showed that all hog production is up 3%. And again, another large June number, the most historically large June number of hogs in history, going back to the uh, 1960s. So that's why those deferred contracts plunged off the cliff mm -hmm. and had a breakaway gap lower this week on the markets. You mentioned exports there. I want to talk about that really quick in the pork markets. We've seen really strong exports. We had really strong export numbers this week. We've got the looming tariff deadlines in the future. Will we continue to see strong exports or do you think we're going to see them fall off the cliff immediately? That's what we're watching. One out of four hogs is exported in this country. Of what is exported, half of that goes to China, Mexico, and Canada. So half it is a big that. deal, yeah. half. It's important to watch it and monitor it because that is what's gonna affect the hog market more than anything. We haven't really seen the hog markets react yet to the tariff and, and trade war threats. Is this the week that we will probably see some reaction this coming week? Yeah, the next two weeks for trading and, and for world negotiations mm -hmm. are historic. It is a historic time to be in agriculture and and, and just being in, in mindful of politics and all of those things. So it's going to be volatile and be ready for it. Really quick, I want to get your quick 30-second thoughts here on the dairy industry. The dairy industry had got prices up to $17 because export demand had been so good. Milk production numbers, um, a 0.8 increase, which was actually the least amount we've seen. Um, but production is still up. Demand had been so strong, but the tariffs is mm -hmm. what made that market fall apart and crumble. But since the fall back has happened, uh, cheese prices have started to pick up and cheese buying has picked up, which lifted that milk market in the short term. But here again, comes down to the tariffs. All right, Naomi Bloom, thank you so much for your insight today. Thank you.
That wraps up the broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will keep the conversation going on Market Plus, where we'll answer more of your questions. You can find it on our website at iptv.org slash mtom. Do you need a break from social media? Resort to the traditional email to send us your comments on the program. Address your message to market to market at iptv.org. Join us again next week when we explore how new shipping concepts within aging infrastructure system. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Delaney Howell. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Wherever your operation takes you, or who you share it with, we'll be where we've been all along. With you, from the word go. Proud sponsor of Market to Market. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. And by Sookup Manufacturing Company. Offering a full line of grain drying and storage equipment and steel buildings, Sookup Manufacturing is on a mission to protect and preserve your crop and the tools that produce it.